Hello, welcome to the first of today's press conferences. And all I have to say to you today is welcome, because uh, Albert will do all the introductions for this press conference on and covering the traces of the Great Tohoku earthquake. Thank you. OK, thank you, Barbara. Good morning, everybody, uh, for the first uh, media conference uh, on uh, this Wednesday. Um, we will talk about today about um, two expeditions which were organized in the wake of the Great Tohoku earthquake, which, uh, as all of you know, occurred uh, last March. Um, first, uh, Professor Gerald Wefer, to my left, uh, will um, explain uh, what the achievements of the so-called Sonne expedition uh, were. Uh, Gerold Wefer initiated and organized this expedition with a German uh, research vessel Sonne, um, and it took place from early March till early April, uh, and he was the uh, chief scientist of this uh, expedition. Um, on this expedition, on this, there were two legs on this expedition. On the second leg, uh, Professor Michael Strasser, in the middle, um, participated. Uh, Professor Strasser was a long-time uh, co-worker of Gerold Wefer at uh, the Marum Institute in, at the University of Bremen. Um, but now he moved uh, back home to Switzerland, I would say, and he's uh, now a professor at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, Michi, as we say, has uh, been part of, so far, two expeditions on the research, on the Japanese research vessel Chikyu, um, and he will be co-chief on another um, Chikyu expedition later this year. Uh, and Chikyu is currently operating off the Japanese coast um, in the so-called JFAST expedition, um, and from Tokyo, we have uh, Kiyoshi Suyohiro here. Um, he's um, CEO and president of IODP Management International. IODP stands for Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. And, um, and he will give an update of the ongoing Chikyu expedition, which started on April 1st and will last for, I think, s uh, f two months. 24th. May 24th. So, okay, the floor is yours, Professor Wiefer. Yeah, welcome. Uh, last year in April, uh, Kiyoshi Tsurio and I, we met uh, at an IODP meeting and I asked him how could we get, how could we work together and he said that there's a need of research vessels because the area is so huge and uh, there's a lot of work to do and at the same time, uh, our minister, Mrs. Chavan, uh, gave a press conference and said that she would support the research between Germany and Japan related to the earthquake. So I submitted a proposal and then got the funding for the research vessel Sonne and uh, developed this program together with Michi Strasser when he, at that time, he was still at Marum in Bremen. And I will this is a ship, it's a quite old ship, uh, but in a very good shape. It's from built in 1976. It's around about 100 meter long and one of our larger research vessels. And the questions we want to uh, address is uh, uh, how it uh, developed, or how, how what the, was the mechanism, the processes uh, of this uh, huge earthquake uh, generating the tsunami and it's related to the collision of two plates of the Pacific plate with a part of the North Atlantic plate and they collide with a speed of around about nine centimeter uh, per year and the special case of this earthquake is that the, the earth earthquake took place in a very shallow depth uh, and also that the, the slide uh, uh, reached the trench. The trench is there around about 7,700, 7,800 um, uh, meter deep. And the question was how we can, uh, uh, how, how are the signs of this earthquake and the sediments and also in changes of the morphology. Uh, here's a picture showing where the, uh, center of the earthquake is. This is here the red star, and then 
This is the area, the projection of the co-seismic slip uh, during this earthquake. And there are also some measurements, so uh, some uh, buoys uh, on the seafloor, uh, then related to GPS. Uh, uh, so the position, the difference in the position uh, was measured. And you see here that from this uh, peninsula, this peninsula moved around about five meter eastward, and then parts of the continental margin uh, would say between 10 and in at the trench area of 50 meter and there's also an uplift uh, between 0 and 10 meter and our aim was and one of the the targets was uh, whether you could document this and changes of the of the morphology using our multi beam system on board we have a system uh, mapping the seafloor and you with on a track you can round round about map an area uh, three times the water depth so if you are in 7,000 meter of water you can map an area in a strip uh, with uh, width of 20 kilometer and this are the first data uh, uh, done by our Japanese colleagues from Jamstack published by Fujiwara and others in 2011 and here is a, here's a comparison of uh, mapping in 1999 and, and 2004. And if you compare this, then you see almost no differences. So blue and this light green shows no difference. And differences are uh, red colors or this yellow co colors. And if you then compare 2011 with 1999, then you see here in an area between 3,500 and 7,700 meter, you see differences and also changes in the trench. And, and the aim was to uh, run other profiles to get a larger picture uh, of this uh, movements and then also uh, answer the question whether the changes in the trench area are a result of landslides or movement in the crust. So this is a working area and for orientation. Uh, here is uh, Sendai and here is uh, Fukushima roundabout. And so it's, uh, we concentrate our, our work on in this area. This is the center of the earthquake. Here's roundabout the center. And so we had three working areas and also use our ROV to visit two observatories installed uh, with an ODP in 1999. And, uh, uh, and uh, Kiyoshi was also co-chief on, on these legs, and then also deploy buoys and, and run these profiles with uh, our multi-beam system and take course. So Albert already mentioned that it was around about one month. We had two legs uh, because of equipment, so we had to, and also uh, we exchanged people uh, in, in between two uh, 13 uh, days cruises. This is our ROV uh, for 4,000 meter water depths. Uh, it was not possible to do all the work we planned with the ROV because of quite bad weather conditions and uh, uh, up to nine meter high waves. So and then it's not possible to use an ROV. But also we deployed new uh, ocean bottom sensors with pressure gauges and uh, seismometers. And uh, this is a cruise track I will just show for orientation. It's uh, oops, uh, just for orientation. And this make, the make a better picture. So we were running 2,500 kilometers of new miles. Uh, uh, miles of new uh, profiles. And now on the way comparing the data with the already existing data and using the same models, so using the same technique, this is very Im important. And we are really surprised that you, that, that you really can use this multi-beam system and see the changes uh, on the continental margin. Then here are the positions of the two <coughs> observatories. They are a bit north. And then uh, we also use an OFOS as a, as a video sledge, and then had to move to this area because of uh, high waves of uh, both for 10 winds and, and so this was the whole program 
And here the road red dots are the positions where we took sediment cores, and Michi Strasser, I think, will say something about the cores. Okay, thank you. Michi, go ahead, please, with the sediment analysis. Okay. Does this follow continuously? Muss man einmal rausgehen und dann als Nummer zwei. And then, yeah. Okay, welcome also from my side. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, basically the first results from, from sampling the seafloor and the subsea floor during, during this expedition where I participated to during the second leg. So it was, this second leg was mainly dedicated to actually sample, the, to get, get samples to, to uh, prove the geophysical data sets, to investigate um, how, how the sedimentary structures on the seafloor um, of these earthquakes look like. So it was basically um, joining these crews and together with, with, with Professor Wafer, we, we, we came up with this plan of, of um, coring in total 16 sedimentary gravity cores, and this is in total 95 meter of core recovery. And these 16 uh, gravity cores, they, they recover between 1 and 11.4 meter of, of, of sediments. And uh, we, they, they ranged uh, between water depths from 1,350 1, to all the way down to 7,550 meter water depths. And this is the same map that Professor Weaver just showed. And here on the left-hand side, you see this, this tool, this gravity core. It's basically a cylindric pipe. Um, with a lot of weight on it, and what we do is we lower it to the seafloor, and by gravity, it, it penetrates into the seafloor and, and, and gets a, a cylindric probe of the seafloor, and this we can analyze um, to, to um, uncover the traces, the sedimentary traces of these great earthquakes. And um, so, so I, I just give you a brief, like the, the three key results here, and then I explain later a little bit um, how, how we, how we um, got to this preliminary result, or to the first result here. And one key result is that we do find characteristic sedimentary and poor water geochemistry fingerprints of the March 2011 Great Tohoku earthquake. So we, we could calibrate um, this, this fingerprint there on the seafloor, in the subsea floor. And the second key result is that we can document the occurrence of earthquake-triggered submarine landslides near the deepest part of the Chapin Trench. And this is, has been introduced by, by Professor Wafer based on this uh, differential bathymetry data by the Japanese colleagues. Uh, based on geophysical data, they already hypothesized that in the lowermost trench there must have been a huge um, uh, s uh, negative um, displacement uh, on the seaward, uh, on the landward slope, and also a positive displacement in the trench itself, and we successfully proved that um, by by getting cores from this area. And the third, and maybe most strikingly, and, and to 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 our to our um, 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 to our biggest interest is that having these cores, they also go back in time. Basically, in, on the seafloor, you have continuous sedimentation every year, a few few centimeters to, to, to millimeters, depending on the environment. And, um, and we were able to, to get a record of, of at least three major sediment remobilization events that potentially suggests the occurrence of previous large potentially 2011 Tohoku-type earthquakes, and we are now working um, on, on further um, identifying this, this event and, and, and eventually dated. I will come back to that later. So, so how, uh, what do we do? How, how, we do, how do we get to this, to the three key results here? Basically, as I sh showed you before, we get, we get this course, and in the core lab, we, we, we open this course, those are different segments, and we open them on board and, and, um, and, and get a first look at the sediments, and then we, we do our analysis, which I will introduce in a second. And also, I kind of like this picture because it shows two master students, one from, from Kochi University and one from, from um, Tokyo University, sorry, not Kochi University, um, Kyoto University, and one from Tokyo University. So it was really an international team with also students, and, and this is kind of, it, it, it will uh, neuter uh, a lot of international collaboration on different levels. So it was this just to, 
to also show this international collaboration here. So, so this on the left hand side and on the right hand side you see two typical cores that we recovered. On the right hand side you see nicely um, some sand layers and these both cores are from the deepest part of, this, uh, of the Japan Trench, so at 7,550 meter water depth. And on the left hand side you see some chaotic um, uh, pebbles or, or clasts floating in, 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 in a muddy matrix and, and this, is, this is a typical indication of submarine landslides. So these, these were the core, as I, sh as I told you before, that these, these are the positive evidence for, for submarine landslides in the trench that, um, I will come back to that later, are most likely triggered by the 2011 um, earthquake because we also do pore water geochemistry analysis which allows us to model the, the equilibrium, uh, disequilibrium in, in, in the pore water which allows us today these events to a very young, like around about one year um, in the past. Um, in, interestingly in this, in this course where we have evidence for remobilization at 7,700 meter water depths, we find uh, microfossils, in this case these are calcareous microfossils, um, um, Coccolithophoridis, and, and usually those are, well not usually, they, they are deposited in, in rather shallow water and shallow in terms of for the Japan Trench, so usually they cannot be deposited deeper than 4,000 or 4,500 meters because they would get dissolved. And we find clear traces of these fossils in the deep sea trench at 7,700 meter water depths and there is basically no other explanation, at least to our current knowledge, how you can get those down there other than remobilizing a lot of um, sediments from the whole margin and we use this as traces for large sediment remobilization events which we uh, in, as a working hypothesis um, interpret as evidences for past earthquakes. Um, at this stage uh, unfortunately we do not really know yet when those past uh, events occurred because we first have to work out the um, the age model, but there are several ash layers. They, th those are big eruptions from the Tohoku arc, and, and these ash layers, their chemical fingerprint is, is, is well known, so we are now working together with the Japanese colleagues to get an age information to eventually um, date these, these uh, past events. No. Okay. <laughs> um, did I, I mentioned this, this is the pore water geochemistry. Um, w w what we do, we, we suck out um, um, pore water from the cores and then analyze here in the lab, uh, we, we analyze alkalinity and, and, and now back in we will analyze the sulfate and basically in, in an undisturbed environment you would have a linear profile of these chemical traces. Um, but we, 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 we found a lot of disturbances in this, in this uh, equilibrium and based on, on, on uh, knowledge about how, how these chemical processes works, we are able to positively identify here the traces of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Okay, this is already my last slide. I would like to summarize the key results again that um, cores document the characteristic sediment and pore water geochemical fingerprint of the March 2011 Great Tohoku earthquake. And we document the occurrence of earthquake triggered submarine landslides. And maybe just like a, as an implication for this, it has been discussed in the literature that earthquake triggered submarine landslides may, may additionally add to a tsunami generation because you also move a lot of, of material and displace the water masses. Um, but based on the aerial um, um, mapping of these features at this stage, we can say at least this one we have identified was rather a smaller um, event, so it may not have uh, necessarily added to the, to the large tsunami, but certainly in terms of hazard and, and future event, these submarine landslides should be considered um, about tsunami generations. And the last key message here is that we discovered the three older major sedimentation um, remobilization events that, that, we, that suggest the occurrence of previous large 2011 type earthquakes. And once we, we, we got the age um, on, on these events, this will be important um, and, and important contributions to 
towards seismic hazard assessment because if you want to calculate the probability of, of uh, occurrence of earthquakes, you, you should know your occurrence pattern. And so far, the Tohoku earthquake was kind of striking. There is evidence for, for a, a, an older similar event about 1,300 years ago, and potentially we have a record that, that, may, that may go back, back further in time, and this will be important for, for recurrence interval estimation of large um, earthquakes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michi. Uh, when uh, the research vessel Zona came back to Yokohama port, um, the Japanese drilling vessel Chikyu was al already underway for its so-called JFAST expedition, and we will hear about this uh, more from Kiyoshi Suyehiro now. Maybe not. Control. Con control F. Yes, control. Right, I have to. Where is full screen? What? Which one? Full screen. How about this? Thank you very much. <laughs> so my name is Kiyoshi Suehiro, and I <coughs> will explain about the ongoing expedition um, of IODP, um, which is, as, as I speak, uh, conducting uh, logging while drilling in the area. And this expedition is the 43rd um, of the whole 10-year decadal program of Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, and it's called Japan Trench Fast Drilling Project. Uh, it's called, not called fast because it, it's drilling very fast, uh, but it's called fast because uh, it is a project that was conceived right after the earthquake uh, in rapid response uh, of the event. So, uh, the drilling site is near the epicenter, uh, and near this is the epicenter, and about 7,000 meters water depth. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, water depth to be doing drilling, and uh, but fortunately, I think thing, things seem to be proceeding well. <coughs> and there are international team of 28 scientists on board. Uh, and one of the things I would like to first say is that this was a truly extraordinary earthquake uh, that uh, we have witnessed. Uh, even over uh, more than 100 years of time, uh, because uh, probably the previous l large earthquake of this magnitude occurred <coughs> around 500 to 1,000 years ago. <coughs> so it's really, really uh, extraordinary. And uh, very unfortunately, seismologists, including myself, did not expect that this would happen. <coughs> uh, the famous uh, tsunami sensor record uh, shows the tsunami sensor were located at 1,000 meters to 1,500 meters water depth, so way out in the ocean. So usually, even if you have big tsunami, they would not register very large tsunami heights. I mean, it would be like less than one meter. But here, uh, this is five meters. So uh, this data alone tells you something extraordinary was happening. <coughs> and it also tells you the importance of uh, making observations at sea, on the sea bottom, and making data available real time. Oops. So the JFAST <coughs> is um, aimed to drill through the very tip of the uh, fault zone uh, that made this devastating tsunami that uh, took lives of nearly 19,000 people. Uh, this is the similar sort of figure that uh, Professor Weffer showed, but I mind you that the vertical exaggeration is large. Uh, as you can see, this is from Chikyu, this is 25 kilometers, and this 25 kilometers is expanded to this length. So although this angle is very much exaggerated, it's really, really low angle. <coughs> and It says here, ruptured zone expected before 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Most seismologists, including myself, believed that the earthquake would only rupture this part and not this part, because this is basically unconsolidated sediments 
very soft, a lot of water, uh, no way to st store strain energy, so it must be freely slipping. That's what we thought. However, that was not the case, uh, as Professor Weber showed from his uh, data. And uh, <coughs> so we now think that this red zone, the whole red zone must have ruptured as an earthquake and caused the tsunami. Uh, so it makes us wonder why did it make this huge tsunami generating earthquake. And one of the uh, things that only drilling can provide is to penetrate through the trench and get the material at the fault zone where the slipping occurred. And then by rapid re rapidly responding to the event, you can measure the trace of dynamic friction uh, pro process uh, by measuring the temperature. Uh, as you can, if you slip, slide your hands uh, like this, and if, if, if you think that this is, this is the uh, Pacific plate subducting beneath Japan, and if you rub it very fast with a lot of pressure exerted, you raise your hand skin's temperature larger. And if you slowly glide it and uh, uh, without putting much pressure, the temperature rises much lower. So uh, in uh, analogous fashion, uh, if you make very detailed uh, measurement of temperature, you can infer what occurred at the uh, fault zone one year ago. And uh, that's what people on board are after. So this is the latest uh, <coughs> this morning, 7 a.m. Uh, report. Uh, they are into uh, getting data. Uh, what we call logging data is looking at how much pore pressure, how much pore water uh, are existing around the hole in order to identify where the fault is. I mean, all estimates are simply guesses. And you, by drilling, you can tell, we hope, uh, by looking at this data uh, where the actual fault might be. Uh, that's, that should be where the stress state rap rapidly changes. And that can be measured by this uh, <coughs> set of instruments. And the target depth is 1,000 meters, and we are now at 730 meters or so from the sea floor. Uh, the water depth is nearly 6,900 meters, uh, about 200 kilometers offshore. <coughs> so this is a fresh photo arrived from the ship, uh, explaining, uh, a scientist explaining the uh, fresh data obtained from this logging. So, uh, as I said, this is still ongoing, and by the end of this cruise on May 24th, we hope that they will have succeeded in establishing observatories uh, and getting actual fault samples uh, to understand what sort of material was capable of storing strain energy and what sort of dynamic action occurred across the fault at the earthquake. And uh, that is something only drilling can provide. <coughs> and IODP uh, is a very multiple discipline science program. Uh, and today, I'm just focusing on this particular uh, <coughs> JFAST expedition. But uh, geohazards are IODP's one of main uh, scientific targets to understand. And uh, on this is a world of seismicity map, and so far IODP has been studying uh, Cascadia area, Costa Rica, Lesser Antilles, and the Nankai Trough area where earthquakes and landslides occur. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, all three. Now the floor is open for questions, of course, as usual. So if there is uh, any comment or question or Please, use the, please introduce yourself and uh, please also use the microphone because, uh, as you know, this, web, uh, uh, this media conference is web streamed. I'm Jonathan Tyrone with Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. Kiyoshi, have you had a chance to uh, review Mr. Strasser and Mr. Wefer's data um, from their expedition? And do you concur that there is data indicating uh, multiple events of the scale we witnessed uh, in March 2011 in the past. 
you re referenced something between 500 and 1,000 years ago. Um, what are your preliminary conclusions based on the data? Uh, this will be my very personal uh, comment. Uh, 500 to 1,000 years ago, uh, I, I said this because there exists a historical record. And, uh, uh, but so, and Strasser said uh, there are at three previous earthquake uh, evidences. So they must go back beyond more than 1,000 years ago, and I'm very much interested in knowing about that. And because it is extremely important to know the recurrence rate of, meaning how often these earthquakes occur uh, over a longer period of time. I mean, and because this is so rare, the historical record only has probably one previous record. And uh, it, com by combining this geological uh, knowledge, uh, we can have better uh, <coughs> idea about what to expect in the future. And not just for Tohoku area, but all around the world. Maybe can I add, I, I would, would, would like to be a bit careful here. I think we have these events, they are huge, but we don't really have a date on it. So I think we really, this Michael uh, showed that we have uh, ash layers and also organic uh, parts we want to date with carbon-14. And, and then we can relate it to an event, maybe this also a uh, uh, reported event. But I, I think we have to be a bit careful here because, yeah, it's... But uh, this is how science works. So you uh, have ideas and the high hypothesis and then try to, to answer questions, but we really need the dates. I mean, the uh, expedition ended two and a half weeks ago, the, the Zonda expedition, so uh, take care of that. Okay, next one. Uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC. Just to be clear here, one of the three previous events could be the one that is 500 to 1,000 years ago, or are you saying these are, these are events much further back in time than that? At, at this stage, we cannot <laughs> answer this question okay. um, because we, we have no, really, as, as Professor Wafer said, we, at this stage, we have no idea on the ages of this, of this event. And so, so all we see that these are three previous major resedimentation events. I mean, in, in, in theory, they, those may not even be related to earthquake because you can, you can trigger large scale um, resedimentation res events um, also by other processes. It's just at this stage, it's the most likely explanation and it has been in the Cascadia. There is a record of 10,000 years turbidites um, nicely um, correlating with tsunami deposits on land. So it, it, it's an established method which is going to be applied for the first time um, to the Tohoku area. And, and, and we, we are among the first who, who have this course available. But, but to answer your question at this stage, it's sim simply not possible because we lack age information. Do you have any information about uh, age in terms of how far you may be able to go back? Any rough estimates of, of how far back in time these, these sediments go? Not no. at this stage, no. yes. Okay. Yeah. But what we, uh, clear to add to this, but, but what we saw and Michi uh, uh, explained it, we have a layer of 50, 60 centimeter and it has a signature of seawater. So this means that through this earthquake, through the shaking, huge amounts of sediments are mobilized and suspended in the water column and then settling down. And then you have the signature. This we can see al also without dating it. The dating is the signature of the geochemistry of the pore water. And I think this is also in, in and this is also reported by uh, uh, measurements in the water column, I think, weeks after the earthquake, that still a lot of material is in the water column and is settling down. And, and it's also very interesting for biolo biologists how fast there this is resettled by organisms. So I think this was a huge event, and, and, and I think through the shaking, all the sediment was uh, destabilized and and mobilized and, and, and transported in the water column. There's another question by Kirin. 
Uh, yes, Quirin Giermeyer from Nature. Um, why should it be such a big surprise that there have been huge events in the more distant geolo geological past when there has been a huge earthquake last year and another one 500 to 1,000 years ago? I can answer this just from, from kind of my, my paleo seismology and sedimentary point of view. It's, it's, it's not a big surprise at all. That, that's what, what you would expect. Um, but it has not been done before. It, it has not been cored before. And, and also the same is true for the tsunami deposits in the Sendai Plain. I mean, that, that there is one core that, that gives uh, previous high tsunami deposits, and, and people are now investigating this, and, and it's, it's not a surprise, but, but somehow we have not, we have not proven this, this, this common knowledge that it really occurs, and we have not used it yet to incorporate in our understanding of the recurrence interval of large earthquakes. So this is kind of a new, a new research direction, at least for the Chapman Trench area, which is now being 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 established. Can I add? Yes, sure, sure. yes. Uh, <coughs> from seismologist's view, as I said in my presentation, the distance from the trench axis inward about 50 kilometers or so, everywhere around the world in where seismological data exist, we, we have been pretty confident that that area is incapable of generating earthquakes. And I, I would say that even the Sumatra earthquake did not m slip that portion. So that was the surprise. Th as Strasa said, the fact that you we experience large tsunamis and earthquakes, that's, that's not a surprise. So, are there any further questions? Dagmar, you would like to interview and quiet, right? Yeah, okay, good. So, if there are no more questions, I think we can conclude this. And uh, if you want to have personal talks, the three colleagues will be around for a while, I think. Um, and Dagmar, uh, and Barbara, now it's your turn, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I just want to say that the next press conference is uh, at 11, and it's on glaciers and ice caps and um, contributions to sea level rise. I hope to see you there. Okay, thank you.